the decision makers in this country had decided that uh, testing would have to be moved underground and so the test site was going to have to learn how to do that. And when they went underground testing in 1961 on, they conducted mainly um, tunnel test and shaft test. Uh, the moratorium came on and then in 63, uh, Kennedy, Great Britain, United States and Russia um, all agreed that we would not do atmospheric testing anymore. So we had to go underground in 1963. The 63 treaty which, which uh, prohibited atmospheric testing went into effect and we, everything was underground after that. Clearly all the things that, that, that happened in the 60s uh, made the test site one of the major battlefields of the Cold War. The 60s were when we were putting lots of new designs in the U.S. weapons inventory, just as the Soviets were making lots of designs because Mutually Assured Destruction said we would have enough nuclear weapons to wipe the Soviet Union off the map. And similarly, similarly they had enough to do the same to us. That was also something that kind of adds to uh, this fear that, my God, they're getting ahead of us. And boy, is this next decade going to be the Soviet decade? And, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Looking back on it, I, I think we, we probably overreacted to that concern, but it was real. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. Duck and cover. Yeah, I was showed duck and cover in school. And we did duck and cover. Ever so often that big old horn would start wailing up a tune. And as soon as that happened, then we were all supposed to climb under our desks and put our heads under our arms, you know, and try and hide because them nasty Soviet Union persons were going to drop big nuclear bombs on our heads. And so we had to protect ourselves. If you were not ready and did not know what to do, it could hurt you in different ways. The duck and cover, that was almost routine. You look at the film now, and, and, and as an adult, you watch the film, they never say the word injury or, de or death. It's the worst thing they said, it could hurt you really, really bad. But they don't tell you you could die from it. We had thousands of nuclear weapons in the U.S. inventory, and the Soviet Union had thousands of nuclear weapons in theirs. Both countries. Uh, escalated the Cold War and ended up with a, a situation what was called mutually assured destruction or MAD, which really decreased the potential use of nuclear weapons. And therefore there would not ever be any any use of nuclear weapons. Now I, uh, I look back at that and I, I am absolutely amazed that it worked. <laughs> Pretty scary stuff when you're third, fourth, fifth graders. Look, I won't kid you about the A-bomb. I've seen what it can do in Japan, Bikini, and a Wetuk. It's deadly. It's like a woman. That I'd have to see. Of course, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, you know, as, as a child, and the whole family was glued to um, the TV in October of uh, 1962, I believe it was. I remember my dad coming home one time really, really frightened. and. Um, and what had happened was the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he, he thought for sure that, that Kennedy was going to blow us off the face of the earth. My, uh, my uncle started digging a big hole in his backyard. He was going to, bid a, he was going to, to uh, put in a bomb shelter. In this case, Radioactive materials are trapped in the particles of dirt or water thrown up by the explosion. When these particles fall back to earth, they may be dangerous. So get indoors immediately after a ground level explosion. Cover broken windows against radioactive dust with blankets or cardboard. When you mention the word nuclear or radiation, uh, they don't want to even talk to you about it. And, and even in those days, uh, it was very prominent. People were scared. I've never been afraid of radiation. 
I treat it with a lot of respect. I think everybody realized that it was detrimental, um, but to, to what extent, I don't think we really knew until we got into the late 50s. Working that close to it, you always had this, uh, this fear that, you know, maybe something's going to happen to me. Uh, all, you know, people I worked close with have all died from radiation exposure, cancer. There began to be a good bit of controversy at this point in time in terms of, you know, the risks that were involved. And, you know, I mean, th there was not this rhapsodic view, wow, uh, it's great that they're detonating atomic bombs out at the Nevada test site. Cratering and excavation through the use of nuclear explosives. And so there was a considerable amount of discussion in the scientific community that we could use nuclear detonations to do massive amounts of excavation. The one that was still when we were in this period of fascination with nuclear was uh, the, the Sedan project. This is the beginning of or part of the plowshare program. Uh, peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Uh, this started in 1960. First device that came along where I was the lead assembly engineer was uh, was that one it just the luck of the draw really I got to put the sedan device together and uh, and then delivered it out to ground zero and then on on uh, on D-Day I was at a place called the monastery so I was looking uh, almost the full length of uh, of Yucca Flat when Sedan was detonated. And I remember some rum, rumbling and then and you could actually see this bubble coming up out of the ground. It rose a hundred feet or so in the air, this big bubble of earth. Uh, and then all of a sudden, flame shot out of it. It, it burst into flame and flame shot out of it. And, uh, and then the mushroom cloud began to form and that was probably one of the most amazing sights I ever saw. And I thought, my God, what is, what in the world are we doing here? What have we done? This is the most terrifying thing that I've ever really seen. Yet this was, this was part of a program that was designed to, uh, to help mankind. This was part of the Plowshare program. I, I was trying to bridge in my mind on Sedan Day. I was trying to walk across this bridge from, from using them as weapons to destroy people to using this as, as a um, means of doing something good. They were really focused on trying to get an engine that NASA could use for deep space kinds of long distance things where you're outside the range of where solar panels will do it. President Kennedy did come to the test site, but that was in uh, 1962, and he basically was interested in uh, the nuclear rocket uh, development station some 20 miles west of us. It was a program he was really tuned into, and he visited the test site. Kennedy really was, was, was the big supporter of the, of the nuclear engine for a spaceship. And, you know, most of the tests that were done uh, were successful. The technology was there. Uh, people solved the engineering problems. After Kennedy's death, what couldn't be resolved were the political problems about how do you assure people that, that this thing is not going to blow up on the launch pad, you know, the country couldn't overcome that fear. That's what killed uh, the plowshare program, and that's what killed the nuclear, the, uh, the nuclear propulsion program of the United States. Today's world, NASA is back looking at that technology again uh, for manned space missions. And in this case, they, instead of trying to launch with that type of an engine, uh, they would launch like with a shuttle or something of that order. and and then assemble it in space like the space station and then the crew would get on board and away you'd go and make a trip to Mars in under nine months. I never dreamed I'd ever see a Russian at the test site. That occurred in 1988 and it was a very, very interesting um, time. It was, the Soviet Union was still the Soviet Union 
and we were looking toward um, developing a method for both sides to, to verify each other. I think nobody trusted the Soviet Union, and so Reagan said, uh, we're not going to sign any treaties that we can't verify. So the joint verification experiment was developed uh, so that the Soviets could have their monitoring equipment on a test here, and we could have um, our monitoring equipment over at their test site associated with the test. I went to New York and met the first group of Soviet diplomats and scientists in uh, at LaGuardia where they had just flown in from, from the Soviet Union and brought them on our airplane out here. And we landed at McCarran, did a press conference at McCarran, and then took them directly to the test site. And it was uh, quite an experience for everybody. And I'm sitting across the table from all of these guys from the Soviet Union, and we're all speaking through interpreters, and I'm thinking, uh, what in the world is happening here? I've spent my entire life working to kill these kinds of people, uh, to arm, to be able to defeat all of them, and here they are. They're sitting at our test site, and we're about to take them out and show them some of our secrets. Three or four days later, we brought them all into town and took them to see Siegfried and Roy at the frontier. They were taken to a buffet. You have to think of how the Soviet Union was not a land of plenty in the 1980s. They saw all this food. Think about what a buffet looks like, and think about the mind-boggling seeing something like that. And they immediately said, well, this is, this is um, propaganda. We learned that the Russians could go through our whole supply of booze out there pretty hurriedly. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that there were a number of events that occurred in the 70s that really kind of brought home that, wait, there's a lot of risk involved in this. Yeah, on Bainberry, I was in the control room uh, talking to our aircraft that was tracking that cloud. The most significant test in the underground series was the Bainberry test on December 18, 1970. And that had an unexpected uh, venting. The vent didn't happen along the main drill hole. Uh, it turned out there was a fault that was adjacent to where the test was being conducted and there was a fracture in the ground at depth where the thing was tested and there was water in there. Up to that point the history of uh, effluent releases had been um, really improving every year um, to a very minimal amount and so this was a uh, unexpected um, experience. When it detonated it it found a pathway, the, the high pressure initially found a pathway, not up the, the chimney that had been refilled and grouted and everything, but came up beside it uh, through this other fracture that they were unaware of. And so that caused them to really tighten the criteria on the geological studies that they did. And, and they never had a repeat of that kind of a, of a release. You know, the United States had made a, uh, had put together a, uh, a program that said we need to do X number of more tests to complete all the things that we have in the sort of the design pipeline. And, uh, and that was the plan, that was the way people were going, but there was a decision made that such and such a date will be the last test period. Never mind how many more engineering development programs you really wanted to do, that's the last one. And of course that, <clears throat> that clearly affected us, but it also clearly affected the British who were getting ready to do the next nuclear test after divider, the ice cap. And uh, they were very disturbed, distressed that, uh, that as a nation we stopped and, and sort of cut them off without notice. On October 2nd, 1992, President George Bush signed a nine-month moratorium stopping all nuclear testing. This moratorium was later extended to an indefinite ban on nuclear testing. 
Nine, the divider test eight, in September seven, of 1992 six, became the 928th five, four, test conducted three, at the Nevada test site two, and one, last nuclear test by the United States. Time.